And on that tape there, he eventually kills her. A group of detectives sit in shock, watching a murder videotaped by the killer himself. I can't hear you what you're saying. You Say it clear. You are the master that pleases me to serve you. You are the master that pleases me to serve you. You are the master that pleases me to serve you. Now you sit your ass down like I said. This is Eagle, and you're listening to True Crime Legacy. Today's episode recounts the horrific story of one of St. Louis' most notorious serial killers who targeted vulnerable women in one of the city's roughest neighborhoods. Through cunning manipulation and advanced planning, he evaded capture for years until cutting-edge forensics and dogged police work finally led authorities to his door. Even in death, our many of his murderous secrets remain buried leaving detectives to piece together a puzzle with missing parts. In the early 2000s, police across the St. Louis metro area were faced with a string of grisly discoveries. The bodies of women, discarded like trash along roadways, in weedy fields, even floating in rivers. As the body count rose, they realized a vicious killer was preying on women in the depths of addiction, selling their bodies to fund their next fix. He became known as the Streetwalker Strangler, the videotape killer, for his passion for recording his depraved acts. His violence knew no bounds, yet he moved undetected through the dark margins of society. This shadowy figure would shake St. Louis to its core, with reverberations still felt decades later. The echoes of unanswered questions, the chill of unfinished business, I'm Eagle. Welcome to True Crime Legacy. Our story begins along North Broadway in the down-and-out Baden neighborhood of North St. Louis. This rundown corridor was known as The Stroll, a dangerous open-air market for prostitution and drugs. Women addicted to crack cocaine worked the streets day and night selling their bodies to fund their insatiable habit. They became easy targets for predators trolling The Stroll. On July 31st, 2000, the body of a partially clothed woman was discovered floating face down near a boat ramp in East St. Louis, Illinois. She was identified as 61-year-old Mary Shields. The autopsy showed she had been strangled. Shields was known to frequent the stroll. Seven months passed before another victim surfaced. On March 24, 2001, the body of 19-year-old Cassandra Walker was found dumped behind an abandoned building in Washington Park, Illinois. She too had been strangled. Walker's mostly nude body showed signs of torture, belt marks around her neck, wrists bound behind her back. She was just a teenager, hooked on crack, selling herself on the stroll. More bodies began turning up at an alarming pace. Eight victims in 14 months. 34-year-old Elisa Greenwade, also found in Washington Park. 36-year-old Teresa Wilson, discarded in West Alton, Missouri. 46-year-old Betty James, left along train tracks in St. Louis. Each woman strangled with links to prostitution and drugs. A walker found the first body. I uh, was a uh, deceased black female, uh, coarsely clad, laying on her back. By May of 2001, there were four more victims across two states, a new one every six to eight weeks. Police came to believe these were the terrible acts of a single madman. We were sure that we had a serial killer. And when you'd get a call, hey, there's another body around here, Jimmy, what would you think? You'd realize that, yeah, more than likely it was the same person. He'd done it again? Yes, sir. And the killer kept killing. By the end of August, eight women were dead and each fit the same vicious pattern. As the victim tally grew, one thing was clear. A ruthless killer was preying on the most vulnerable women in the St. Louis area. The press dubbed him the Streetwalker Strangler. The FBI joined local agencies forming a task force to hunt the elusive killer. They canvassed the stroll and surrounding neighborhoods for witnesses or leads. They compiled an extensive victimology profile. Every woman was African-American, 
between 19 and 61 years old with a history of prostitution and crack use. Most were nude or partially clothed when found. Some had items belonging to other victims. More than 10 investigators were charting connections among the murders, and they had several theories. The most common profile for a serial killer is a young white male loner. Because many victims were left near major highways, some thought the killer might be a truck driver whom people didn't notice. But they also pursued something new, an urban predator who works in inner city like a killing field. The police gave the name Streetwalker Strangler to this person. Bryant, who broke the story that a serial killer was on the loose. What kind of person did police believe they were looking for? They had no clue. They had no idea. They just thought it was a person who liked to pick up prostitutes, but that's all they knew. He was getting away with it. The killer was evolving, becoming more brazen and violent with each murder. He transported bodies across state lines to confuse investigators about jurisdiction. He tortured his prey by gagging them and binding their limbs. His bare hands or belts were used to squeeze the life from them. Then he discarded them along roadways like trash, not even attempting to conceal them. He was sending a clear message about how little he valued these women's lives. With each grim discovery, the task force intensified the hunt. They needed a break in this case before the body count rose even further. In May 2002, St. Louis Post-Dispatch reporter Bill Smith wrote an article profiling 36-year-old victim Teresa Wilson. It described her struggles with addiction and life on the streets before meeting her tragic end. A week after the story ran, Smith received a strange piece of mail at his office. Decided to try to make people care by telling the story of one victim. He chose Teresa Wilson, whose body was dumped along a highway. So decomposed, police couldn't tell how she'd been killed. She grew up in this house. At 17, she was a mother. She named her daughter Chastity. She was extremely close um, to her daughter and very, very loving. Um, her daughter was the be-all and end-all um, in, in Teresa's life. Until crack cocaine took over. Johns would pick her up and she would ask Chastity to stay and to wait for her. But she'd be telling her little girl, wait here on Broadway while I, while I go turn a trick. She, she would do that, yeah. Police believe it was here on Broadway where the killer picked up Teresa. Five days after Bill Smith's story ran, he found this letter in his mailbox. It was written on a computer, printed in red ink. And if true, the message was terrifying. Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. I'll tell you where many others are to prove I'm real. Here's directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Included with the letter was a small map. Smith called the police task force and gave them directions to that spot. Our search team started in this direction right here, and as we worked our way into this area, right at this location right here, a human skull was discovered. It was bleached white. You could not miss it. The letter had an odd return address. I thralled him. 325 331st Lafayette Street, New York. Thraldom means slavery or bondage. The zip code belonged to Manhattan, but the address was fictitious. This immediately struck Smith as odd. Why invent a location? The letter was postmarked locally in St. Louis, so it had been mailed from right there in the city. Stranger still, the letter had been typed on a word processor in an artsy font with red ink. It contained a map trimmed neatly to remove its origin. This was no ordinary piece of mail. As Smith read the disturbing contents, he knew this was from the killer himself, taunting investigators and reaching out directly to the media. The letter ridiculed Smith for writing a sob story about Teresa Wilson. The killer then offered a chilling deal. Write one about Green Wade, write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are to prove I'm real. He directed Smith to place the story in that Sunday's paper, just like Wilson's profile. An X marked the spot on the map where Smith could search for new remains if he complied with the request. The location was along Highway 67 near the intersection with St. Charles Rock Road in West Alton, Missouri, 
about 20 minutes from downtown St. Louis. Smith wasted no time alerting authorities. When investigators searched the woods near the X, they located the skeletal remains of an unidentified female victim, just as the killer promised. The game was on. Investigators were unable to pull any fingerprints or DNA from the letter and map. The killer had been careful not to leave any traces. When they tried tracking the unique stationery and font, another dead end. Just as frustration was setting in, the task force caught a break thanks to some high-tech detective work. A cybercrimes investigator with the Illinois State Police spent hours scouring every online and CD-based mapping service available to the public. He finally matched the map to the travel website Expedia, which contracted with Microsoft for its mapping software. This proprietary map could only have come from Expedia during a defined period. Armed with this lead, the FBI subpoenaed Expedia and Microsoft for records of everyone who accessed that location in West Alton between the publication of Smith's article on May 19th and the letter's postmark on May 21st. Through IP addresses used to download the map, they narrowed it to a single user who visited the site on the evening of May 20th. The IP address traced back to the ISP Unet which provided a billing address in the 1000 block of Ford Drive in Ferguson, Missouri. It was time to identify the man behind the map. And the killer had even clipped the edges off that computer map to make it harder to trace. But he hadn't planned for Sergeant Bob Muffler, a cyber investigator who tracks down criminals on the internet. There it is. Sergeant Muffler went to one popular site called MapQuest. Watch as he zooms in on West Alton, Missouri. The area detailed on the killer's map. This is the intersection of St. Charles Street and Highway 67, and right away you can pretty much tell it doesn't look like that map that was sent to the uh, newspaper. Take a look. The cops went to other sites. Here on Yahoo, again you see, the icon for Highway 67 looks different. They didn't use Yahoo. After four days of searching, investigators tried Expedia.com. One thing right away I noticed is that the icon was extremely close to the intersection, and it looks like it's the same shape. Close, but still not an exact match. Now, it's not quite on the intersection there, is it? That's right. When you go up to print the map, that's where it gets real close, real fast. Bingo. Now you've got almost an identical replica of what the killer had sent to the newspaper. That's correct. Now let's meet Maury. On the morning of June 7, 2002, a task force led by St. Louis County Police closed in on the address traced from the map. A man named Maury Travis answered the door, visibly annoyed at the early morning disturbance. Travis lived there with his girlfriend, but the home actually belonged to his elderly mother. Investigators described Travis as unstable and combative when informed they were there to serve a search warrant. He reluctantly admitted, yeah, I know why you're here. Travis's demeanor shifted from aggression to resignation. He knew the jig was up. They're now ready to close in on a suspected serial killer, but he is confident until the end. In fact, he had one last play, a move so dramatic, no one thought it possible. It was 7 a.m. on a quiet morning last June when authorities knocked on Maury Travis's door. They had linked him to the computer map, but they still needed evidence to prove he was the streetwalker strangler. He answered the door very agitated, uh, why, wanted to know why the police were there. He was told, you know why we're here. The first floor of the home seemed normal, but the hidden basement revealed a house of horrors. Blood spattered the walls, ceiling, carpet, and furniture. Women's items were strewn about, shoes, underwear, wigs a stun gun and tape used for binding victims, and the computer used to access the Expedia map. Sitting in his living room, the investigators asked about the missing women, but never accused Travis of killing them. They had a casual conversation with him, sitting on the couch for two hours. It was kind of a cat and mouse type conversation. One thing Travis did seem curious about was what brought police to his home. They said it was the internet. He cursed under his breath and made some reference to the computer. So he knew he had tripped himself up. He knew why we were there. 
After four hours of jousting, they took him to police headquarters. Captain Hager went in to talk with Travis himself. He made reference to my investigator that he wanted somebody else brought in because he found this man to be a bore and wanted somebody more challenging. But sitting in the interrogation room, Travis must have realized his mind games were almost over. He knew what police would find at his house. In the basement, a secret torture chamber where medieval cruelty was dished out with modern efficiency. I see a stun gun here. Very effective, can disable people. Wow. Do we have reason to believe that he used it on these women? Some of the pictures of the victims, uh, they had burn marks on the upper body. Travis kept scrapbooks on torture and had collected every article about his terrible crimes. But the most horrifying discovery were these tapes. Detectives questioned Travis for two tense hours while the search continued. He refused to outright confess, but became enraged upon learning the map gave him away. Shortly after, Travis agreed to go downtown for further questioning. He was caught and he knew it. Meanwhile, the FBI's computer forensics team examined Travis's machine and recovered drafts of the letter to Bill Smith. The electronic trail led directly to Travis's door. At police headquarters, detectives placed photos of each victim before Travis and asked if he recognized them. Travis claimed ignorance. But minutes later, he asked to review the pictures again. An interesting request for a man who just denied knowing the women. When detectives mentioned the women had all been murdered, Travis fell silent. They hadn't actually told him that fact yet. Travis was already intimately familiar with their fates. In a chilling move, Travis offered to lead police to another body, this time in East St. Louis. However, when they neared the bridge to cross into Illinois, Travis abruptly aborted the trip and demanded to be taken back to jail. The bait and switch was clearly a tactic to gauge how much investigators already knew. Despite Travis's mind games, he still hadn't outright confessed. A detective brought Travis a soda during questioning. After he finished drinking, Travis crumpled the can and tossed it away. That can was later collected as evidence. Through DNA analysis, the crime lab matched saliva from the soda can to semen samples collected from two victims, Yvonne Crew and Brenda Beasley. This forensic analysis linked Travis directly to their murders, even without a confession. Additionally, blood samples collected from the basement matched six of the known victims. Investigators were building a slam dunk case against Travis brick by brick. Now they focused on getting him to admit what they already knew. He was the streetwalker strangler stalking the stroll. Detectives searching Travis's house uncovered a critical piece of evidence, multiple videotapes hidden in the basement. Their contents were so horrifying that St. Louis Police Chief Joe Mulkwa ordered every officer who viewed them to undergo psychiatric counseling. These were no ordinary home movies. One tape labeled Your Wedding Day showed Travis committing depraved acts of torture, rape, and murder on different women at various times. This was his personal catalog of brutality. Part of the tape depicts 19-year-old Cassandra Walker chained by the neck to a wooden beam in the basement, her hands and feet bound behind her. Travis forces her head back and wraps a belt around her neck, strangling the life from the young woman as the camera rolls. Travis had recorded every step in how he ensnared his victims. First, in his bedroom, he gave them crack cocaine to smoke and have sex with them. Next, he would get them to engage in strange rituals. Travis would dress them in white and put sunglasses on them. Then, listen carefully. Police believe that is the sound of Travis dragging a woman down the steps to his basement. There, he shackled them and turned into a monster. With Walker's lifeless body at his feet, Travis narrates to the camera, this is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name, 
I don't know. First kill was nice. ...of his handiwork. This is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name, I don't know. His cruel tactics also included gagging victims with tape wrapped around their faces. Travis berates one woman for getting into a car with a stranger while assaulting her. You sorry about what? For jumping in a car with a guy you don't even know? He taunts. When the woman mentions having a child being raised by her parents, Travis cuts her off. You ain't raising. You're over here on your back smoking crack. The I'll say something to your kids. <laughs> mama, sorry. You were raising your kids. Me and my mama and dad. You ain't raising shit. You on here in your back smoking crack. You ain't going home at all. I'm gonna keep you about a week. Push his total dominance. Master. Say it clear. You want the master? On one tape, Travis plays out his blood sport to the end. Police were horrified to watch Travis wrap a belt around the neck of this woman then choke her to death on camera. This is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name, uh... Stomach-churning footage confirms what investigators already knew. Maury Travis was the ruthless killer preying on women along the stroll. He derived sadistic pleasure from dehumanizing the vulnerable victims before snuffing out their lives. If the videotapes weren't enough, detectives made another chilling discovery, a hand-drawn diagram of basement renovations to create a torture chamber. Travis was constructing a soundproof dungeon where he could chain up victims long-term. Investigators also found a supply list for the planned renovations. It included building materials, sound-absorbent foam, and adult diapers to contain victims for extended captivity. How many women would have suffered unimaginable torture if Travis had completed this psycho lair? His bloodlust was never going to be satisfied. Though Travis still hadn't formally confessed, the mountain of evidence left no question. He was the street walker strangler. Now in custody on kidnapping charges, his reign of brutality attacking the most vulnerable women in the St. Louis streets had come to an end, or so it seemed. With Travis behind bars on federal kidnapping charges, prosecutors weighed additional charges across multiple jurisdictions tied to the string of murders. Detectives worked to piece together a timeline of Travis's killing spree. They uncovered a gap between murders at the end of 2001 when Travis was briefly jailed for an unrelated offense. The delay provided more confirmation he was the killer. But not all of Travis's secrets died with him when he took his own life just days after the arrest. You see, some serial killers will take their actual victim count to the grave, especially those unmotivated by fame or notoriety. On June 10, 2002, one week after being taken into custody, Travis was found hanging lifeless in his cell, dead by his own hand. Rather than face justice, he chose to silence himself permanently. Guards at the St. Louis County Jail were supposed to check on high-risk inmates like Travis every 15 minutes. However, they failed to check on him for two consecutive periods, enabling Travis to craft a noose from his bedsheet threaded through the cell's air vent. He even restrained his own hands behind his back so he couldn't try to break free once the hanging began. Travis wanted to be sure he finished the job. He left behind a suicide note addressed poignantly to his mother, apologizing for causing her pain. The note stated, I don't know why. I was just sick. I've never felt normal or happy at any time in my life. I think about the life I lead and what's ahead of me. This seems the best solution for all involved, especially me, because I won't spend the rest of my life locked up or worse, let them kill me with a needle. However, noticeably absent from the note was any admission of guilt or remorse for the murders themselves. Until his final breath, Travis refused to acknowledge the brutal acts committed at his hands. 
Detectives were deeply troubled by being denied the closure of hearing his confession. So many lingering questions would remain forever unanswered. At the time of his death, Travis was directly linked through DNA and other evidence to 12 murders. However, he had cryptically boasted of claiming 17 lives. That left the fate of five unknown victims still hanging in the balance. Any hope of identifying those remaining women died along with Travis. Lead investigator Tim Sachs was devastated that Travis took his secrets to the grave. In an interview, Sachs lamented, We had a million questions, a million and one questions, and Travis took every answer with him. Maury Travis was never charged or convicted for the serial murders that gripped the St. Louis area in fear. But the extensive evidence leaves no doubt. He was the ruthless killer who came to be known as the Street Walker Strangler. Travis took sadistic satisfaction in preying on vulnerable women and recording their torment. He managed to keep his sinister hobby concealed from those closest to him, and he died on his own terms, denying investigators the closure they sought. This complex case stayed with detectives long after the final gavel. For some, the lingering mystery became a lifelong obsession. That concludes this episode of True Crime Legacy. Thank you for joining me to explore a dark chapter in St. Louis history. We hope you'll join us next time as we peel back the layers on another complex and chilling true crime story. I'm Eagle. Be safe out there.